Welcome everybody. This is How to English. Teach and learn with Gavin M. It's a podcast about teaching and learning English as a foreign language. All opinions stated are personal and references will be given when necessary. Words. Words, Gav. <laughs> Gav, what is a word? It's a linguistic form. An expression, a term, a monosyllable, morpheme. Oh. Speech form, polysyllable, collocation, idiom, locu- locution. Okay, until then you sounded very knowledgeable. But Phrase, yeah. coinage, yep. colloquialism, All euphemism, um, loanword, mm. archaism, modernism, neologism, vernacularism. I probably knew about three, maybe two of those words. Are we going to get this deep this early, Gav? Not if you don't want to, Em. We could just jump straight to the fun bit where I ask you lots of questions. Can we do that? Yeah. Em, what is linguist? <laughs> <laughs> now, you know most of these words. For example, a morpheme is a word which cannot be further divided. For example, incoming. in come ing. It can't be divided into more parts than the in, the come, and the ing form. Morpheme. I thought yeah. that was a kind of drug that makes you feel no pain, but I think that's morphine. I think that's with an N. N for November, not M for mother. Right, yeah. But there are other words like a polysyllable, which has more than one syllable. You've got collocations. Yep, I know that one. Tell me. Words that commonly go together. Ah. Like... Like thunder and lightning, knife and fork, salt and pepper. Fish and chips. These are common collocations. You say one and you naturally want to say the other one to follow. That's it. These are all forms of words. Idioms. Like the tip of the iceberg. That's a good one. The cat's whiskers. That's a great one. Yeah. What about a third one? We usually do them in threes, don't we? One more, one more, one more. To beat around the bush. Yeah, but you're not beating around the bush now, Gav. You're going straight to the point. I am. Locution is a word or expression, especially in regard to style or idiom. For example, a person's style of speech. Do you remember people used to talk about elocution lessons? I do. So that must be the root word, locution. Mm. Okay. So there are plenty of words that we associate with words. Em, do you know coinage? To coin a phrase. Is That's that what it, it like to, to hit the nail on the head? <laughs> Using an idiom to describe a coinage. That's it. So it's an invention of a new word, which also could be a neologism, which is a newly coined word or expression. Oof. Yeah. So we've got modernisms. What are the old words that our students often say? We say, oh, no, we don't talk like that anymore. That was back in Dickens' time. Right. So that's archaisms. It is an archaism. Do you know what a loan word is? Loan word. Like a lone wolf, maybe. It acts alone. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Loan, like the opposite of to borrow. Oh, loan. I thought you meant loan like L-O-N-E, alone. Loan word, like one that you borrow from another language, perhaps. That is precisely it. Em, you're great at this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you've got euphemisms. That one's funny, isn't it? That's when you say things like, they're getting up to some funny business. <laughs> That's it. So, wink, wink. Oh, yeah. Well, it could be a bit rude or it could be mischievous criminal acts. Yeah, I think we used to say things like, I'm just going to go and powder my nose. But I don't really use that now because I don't powder my nose. But okay. we all knew that meant to go to the toilet. Ah, to pee. Right, okay. Yeah. So that's another good euphemism. How about the vernacular? Vernacular is that to do with regional dialect, isn't it? That is precisely what it is, M. So you might say that person is speaking in the vernacular. This may be a dialect which is regional. And it's in a lot of books as well. And it's written the way it sounds, which you have to adjust your brain a little bit to just think, okay, this isn't a word I recognise, but this is how it's pronounced. Precisely. So there's a nice little summary of the word 
word. In other words. Fantastic. Wow. Where do we go from here? Now, Em, well, thank you to Merriam-Webster for some of those synonyms. Yeah, do check out a good synonym thesaurus if you need to expand your vocabulary. Because this episode, Em, is number 13, and we're going to title it Words. Dun, 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 dun. Words. Em, before we get any deeper... The... <laughs> We've gone quite deep already, <laughs> it's already but yeah. quite deep, isn't it? Um, I would like to introduce Whizbusters. Now, you might remember them from our December special show last year, season two, where they sang the 12 Days of Christmas. I do remember that. Very nice version it was too. So catchy. I could not stop singing it through January, February into spring. I think it was still in my head. Uh-huh. So Wizbusters have created some amazing resources for teachers and learners. You can find them on YouTube and they have their own website and vocabulary builder. That's right, Gav. On their website, you can access hundreds of vocabulary, quizzes and explainer videos featuring easy to understand examples of words, catchy music and cool animations to help you test memorize and review new words from basic to advanced level English. The site is especially good for students looking to swat up on their language exams. They describe it as the ultimate vocabulary builder to fast track your learning. Now, for a limited period, Wizbusters are offering a free, yes M, free lifetime membership for their vocabulary builder, which you can find the link for in our show notes or from their YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Wizbusters. That's Wizbusters, W-H-I-Z. B-U-S-T-E-R-S. They also have explainer videos on their YouTube channel with educational videos on fascinating topics such as why do we need the brain? Why learn math? The human skeleton and why do we need water? With key language built into the videos so you can learn the words in context and discover fascinating facts. I can't recommend Wizbusters enough, Gav. I've tried it and it's fantastic. And I've already suggested their resources to my students. I think every learner should have a vocabulary builder in their pocket, ready to practice and improve their vocabulary every day. So definitely visit them today before the offer finishes. Em, that's a really good point. I think every student should have a resource that they go to if they're sitting on the train, if they're on the bus, if they're walking to work. Be careful, make sure that it's a safe route, but pull out your phone, do a quick quiz, learn some new vocabulary, do some revision, have fun learning English. And Wizbusters have got the solution for you. M, let's go back to basics. I know that you have a computer in front of you and on that computer is the internet. Yep. Can you tell us? How many words there are in English? Oh, okay. Wait a second. Yep. Uh, So, according to EnglishLive.ef.com, it says there are an estimated total of one. How many is that? One. Six. (laughs) I know more than one. How many is six zeros? That's million. A million. One million twenty-two thousand words. Six zeros with a yeah. with a number in front of yeah. it. Yeah. One million twenty-two thousand. That's extraordinary. So that means words with all of their different meanings as well. Because that we don't have more than a million words. No, but it is growing by several thousand each year, apparently. Wow, that's amazing. But it's quite official that a lot of people estimate there are more than a million words. That's incredible. And how many does the average person know? The average person knows about 20,000 words. Oh, that's that's more manageable. Passively 40,000. Wow. So that means you maybe recognise the word, but you might not have it in your active vocabulary. 
Yeah, it's interesting though. You know double the number of words that you actually use. Makes sense. There's a lot of formal words that I never use. And there's a lot of very informal words that I never use. So I guess you've got that kind of middle ground of, did you say around 20,000? Yeah. Right. That's extraordinary and an absolutely fascinating fact. Thank you for sharing that with us, Em. And if any of the listeners have some interesting facts, please send them to Em so she can add them to her fascinating fact list all about words. Maybe there'll be a new feature in the pipeline. (laughs) I'm looking forward to it. So as teachers, we have a lot on our plates to try and help our students memorise all of these words that we have. To bring them from their passive knowledge into their active knowledge. And even just put them into their passive in the first place. Now, Em, I'd like to invite our guest speaker, Kitty Sensei. Now, Kitty is a corporate English teacher who equips her students with clarity, confidence and credibility. She has a huge video library of free lessons where she teaches business idioms, speaking skills and some online lessons demonstrating her dynamic and engaging teaching style. So type Kitty Sensei, S-E-N-S-E-I, into YouTube and also take a look at Kitty's links in our show notes to find her on Instagram. That's right, Gav. And Kitty is here to discuss the topic of learning vocabulary, which fits perfectly with today's show. Let's begin. Thanks for having me here, Em and Gav. My topic that I would like to share with our students and the listeners in this program is to improve their learning vocabulary in English without even memorizing it. Yes, it's possible. Are you struggling in memorizing new words in English? Are you fed up with a traditional way of memorizing new words? from dictionaries and glossaries that we were forced to use at school and forget all those words the next day. You're not alone. I also experienced that when I was at school. What if I told you that you can learn vocabulary without a huge effort or memorization? With this method that I'm using, you will remember a huge amount of new vocabulary in a natural and pleasant way. Number one, get a notebook. Not too fancy, not big. Just uh, find or, or else you will never write anything on it. And make sure you have a positive relationship with a notebook. On the first page, write down your favorite English quotes. For example, Every mistake, it leaves the equivalent of success by Napoleon Hill. Then, start writing newly expressions that you have learned in an article in the book that you're interested in. Try to read it aloud and use the expressions that you've written in your daily conversation in English. Repeat this at least three times a week until you own it. Research shows that students who use memory tricks perform better than those who do not. Memory tricks help you expand your working memory and help access long-term memory. These techniques can also enable you to remember some concepts for years or even for life. Let's dig deeper into our simple memory tips and tricks. Try to understand the information first. That's number one. Information that is organized and makes sense to you is easier to memorize. If you find that you do not understand the material, spend some time on understanding it before trying to memorize it. Connect the information that you are trying to memorize to something that you already know. Number three, sleep on it. Studies show that your brain processes and stores information while you sleep. Try to review information just before you go to sleep and see if it helps embed the information in your memory. Number four, self-test. 
quiz yourself every so often by actively recalling the information that you are trying to study. Make sure to actively quiz yourself and do not simply reread notes or a textbook. Often students think they remember material just because it is familiar to them when they reread it. Instead, ask yourself questions and force yourself to remember it without any looking at the answer or any materials. This will enable you to identify areas that you are struggling with. You can then go back to one of the memory tricks to help yourself memorize it. Also, avoid quizzing yourself immediately after trying to memorize something. Wait a few hours or even a day or two to see if it has really stuck in your memory. Number five, use distributed practice. For this concept is to move from your temporary working memory to your long-term memory. Two things that's needed to happen. The concept should be memorable and it should be repeated. Use repetition to firmly lodge information in your memory. Number six, write it out. Writing appears to help us more deeply encode information that we're trying to learn because there is a direct connection between our hand and our brain. Try writing your notes by hand during a lecture or rewriting and reorganizing notes or information by hand after a lecture. While you are writing out a concept you want to remember, try to say the information out loud and visualize the concept as well. Number seven, create meaningful groups. What do you mean by that? In this groups, there's a good strategy for memorizing it to create meaningful groups and that simplify the material. For example, let's say you wanted to remember the names of four plants, garlic, rose, hawthorn, and mustard. The first letters abbreviate to G-R-H-M. So you can connect that with the image of Graham Cracker. You get that a biscuit now all you need is to remember to picture a graham cracker and the names of the plants will be easier to recall as in garlic rose authorant and mustard graham cracker it sounds good right okay number eight use mnemonics what do you mean by mnemonics mnemonics are systems and tricks that make information memorable one common type is when the first letter of each word in a sentence is also the first letter of each word in a list that needs to be memorized. Okay, for example, many children learn the order of operations in math by using the sentence, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. What does it mean? Okay, here's the meaning. Parenthesis, exponents, multiply, divide, add, subtract. Right? Did you get the mnemonics here? Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. It's not literally the answer to memorize the mathematical equations or any formulas. But the meaning of that is please stands for parenthesis. Excuse stands for exponent. My stands for multiply, dear, divide, aunt, add, Sally is subtracts. This is one of the example of a mnemonic systems or we call it tricks. Number nine is to talk to yourself. It may seem strange at first, but talking to yourself about the material that you are trying to memorize can be an effective memory tool. Try speaking aloud instead of simply highlighting or rereading information. It really works. Okay, number 10, exercise. What? Seriously? Of course, I should recommend this tool. 
Studies show that exercise can improve our memory and learning capabilities because it helps create neurons in areas that relate to memory. Cardio and resistance training like weights both have powerful effects. So do what works best for you. Last but not least, interleaving. What does it mean? This type of learning technique involves mixing together different topics or forms of practice. In order to facilitate learning, let's say for example, if a student uses interleaving while preparing for an exam, they can mix up different types of questions rather than study only one type of questions at a time. In conclusion, these techniques can feel very strange at first or take some time to develop. Yes, because learning vocabulary is not as a snap of your fingers. Yes, I get it. Always remember that the more you practice them, the easier and more natural they become and the more information you can commit to memory. Remember that you do not need to do every tip that I have mentioned. What you have to do is to experiment with a few and find which ones that will work for you. Oh, there were some really inspiring tips there. Get a notebook. I think this is number one for me. I say to my students, get a notebook. I love Kitty's idea of writing a motivational quote at the top of your notebook and then write some keywords and phrases that you hear, you see, you read in your exercise books, in your story books that you're enjoying. Just try to get down as much as possible and as Kitty said, use them in your daily conversations. Own those words. I think it's really important what she said about the association of these words and if you enjoy them and you like the words it's about getting rid of that negative idea about learning you know it's not this long list of boring words that don't mean anything to you so if you've got a list of words that are really relevant or remind you of a book you were reading or every time you think of the word you think of a place I think that's a lovely mnemonic. She talked about mnemonics. I think that was another really good tip. Do things, enact things, make them real, say them out loud. I like the using your hands thing, you know, just whatever it is, try it. If it works for you, keep doing it. Exactly, Em. These techniques can prompt words to pop into your head. They can come from feelings, emotions, memories. Don't forget to organize your notes in a way that makes sense to you. Have a look around, see how other people organize their notes, but maybe you prefer groups of words in this way. Maybe you prefer making lists. Maybe you need sentences. Maybe you prefer sounds or words that are similar in some way, but organize the words, the vocabulary, the lexus in the way that you prefer. Do you know any helpful acronyms, Gav? As Kitty was describing about these systems or mathematical equations, do you know any mnemonics to help you remember these? Honestly, Em, mnemonics is not my sort of thing. I just don't have the kind of brain that can recall these sentences that prompt specific groups of words but perhaps you know one or two i do yeah gab so there's definitely one for the planets mother visits early monday just stays until noon and then in brackets passes because when i was at school it was mercury venus earth mars mother visits early monday just is jupiter saturn Uranus, and then Neptune. And we added Pluto in my day, but now it's been demoted. That's just a rock. Yeah. So that's how I remember the planets. Mother visits early Monday, just stays until noon passes. But I don't believe you don't remember any. You must know the the rainbow, but you must remember Richard of 
Richard of York gave battle in vain. There we go. I just prompted you and the rest came. I don't know where that came from. I don't think I ever said that before. Years and years ago, you learned that at school and it's still in there somewhere. What about how to spell the word necessary? My sister taught me this one. Thanks, sis. Never eat cake, eat salad sandwiches and remain young. Oh, that's amazing. Isn't there one for Mississippi as well? <laughs> Mrs. M, Mrs. I, Mrs. S. I don't, <laughs> I don't <remember>. know. <laughs> Maybe the ones that are kind of lyrical and musical um, come to me a little bit faster because I have like a little tune in my head. Yeah. Have you got more tips for us, Em? <laughs> I think I'm out now. I think that's all of mine. Fascinating. <laughs> so these things that we learn by heart, they're somewhere deep in our subconscious There's another thing that comes to mind, making questions. So question order, I think there is a quasi and an asy, and that has always stuck in my mind, and I often use it with students. So Q, question word, A, auxiliary, S, subject, and I, infinitive, which kind of spells quasi, and asy being without the question word, auxiliary, subject, infinitive, do you like Ice cream. Ah, oh, for a yes no question. That's right. That is very useful and easy to remember. Mm, quasi asy. I really respond well to these mnemonics, but how do you remember things? I think I'm more of an auditory learner, so it's the sounds, and if it's a bit more musical or maybe there's some kind of rhyme, then that tends to stay with me a bit better. So maybe if I wanted to learn a new word, I might put it into a sentence and that sentence could rhyme or perhaps have some kind of pattern, a bit more like poetry. So that might stick with me better than simply trying to memorise a list of words. I like it. You could even have groups of words that all rhymed to try and remember them if there was a new group of words, for example. That's quite nice as well. Definitely a personal thing, isn't it? Find what works. I think for me also, telling somebody else really, really helps me. If I say, I learned a new word today and this is what it means and I'm going to tell you it in a sentence and then try and remember to keep using it. Once you teach somebody else that word, it definitely helps you remember it. That's exactly what you made me remember. Teaching something helps you learn it. Sure does. So um, let's imagine we're working for a language school. And they call us up and say, hey, Gav, or hey, Em, we really need you to do a cover lesson for us, to cover for a teacher who's ill. And the school asks us to prepare some kind of vocabulary games for some teenagers, maybe A2 slash B1 level. So we sit down, we think, oh, okay, let's open our laptops and find a couple of websites where we might get some tips on some vocabulary games. Em, I'm going to send you a link and I want you to open it. And I thought between us, we can decide if these games are suitable for our imaginary class that we're preparing for. Okay, so let's open the link, the website justlearn.com forward slash blog forward slash vocabulary slash games. And it says 12 great vocabulary games to make learning words more fun. Right, Em, I can see the first game here is Scrabble. Now that's a board game and I don't tend to use board games in the classroom. How about you? Sometimes, yeah. I think they're quite good, especially for a cover lesson. I think that would be a really good one, just take in Scrabble. That's your lesson sorted, really. That is actually, because that could be a good 45 minutes to an hour of just playing the game. And then you could make sentences from the words and pick out opposites to the words if you want and make a story out of the whole board. It would be a really good activity. That's a really fun idea. But I don't tend to take board games in because I like to be a bit more spontaneous. I don't want to say, right, now everybody, we're going to do this one thing here. I want to be up and moving around. Mm. I don't find it maybe dynamic enough. Well, if you want something a bit more dynamic and fun, maybe vocabulary bingo would be a good one. How does that work? Can you explain that to us, please? You might need a little bit of prep for this. You'd have to find a list of words that students knew or had been studying or maybe from the student's book. You could just take that word list from one unit. Or you could ask the students to write the list for you. 
That's a very good idea, Gav. That would be immediately productive. And then you get them to make a grid that's four by four, put the words randomly into the grid, and then you collect them. That's it. So the teacher collects them from the students, mixes them all up, gives the cards back to the students. And then how do you do the bingo part, Em? Either the teacher or a student could read out the definitions of the words and then if the student has that word, they tick it off and the first one to get all of the words on the card shouts bingo. Wow. Vocabulary bingo. Mounting sense of excitement in that one. (laughs) That's very good. I also like headbands. Oh, I've got that game. Yeah, that's loads of fun. Want to explain how that one works? Each student wears a headband and they have a card attached to the headband which has the name of something or a word or a person and they ask, am I a noun? Am I a verb? Am I an adjective? And they have to ask yes or no questions and the class answer, yes, you are, no, you're not until eventually you guess what you are. So you could be a hedgehog, you could be Miley Cyrus, you could be a drainage system. (laughs) Great ideas. Um, Really, yeah, cross the board there. So it's really good for question structures, isn't it? It's great for that. The repetition of it just is what they need. I think so. It's very good for low level, but... If you make the noun or the verb or the adjective or even phrasal verbs, if you make them more complicated, then that will require more complex questions from the students. So that's a call activity headbands. And you could be doing that for half an hour at least. Yeah, easy. It's a very fun game. Em, could you describe 20 objects to us? What's that vocabulary game that you might play in your classroom? You collect objects from the students, could be in their bags or just around the room, and then you show them all, maybe on the floor or on a desk, to the students. And you could play this in different ways, but I think the original game is that you show them for about a minute and then you take them all away and you see how many they can remember. And who's the winner of this game? The one who remembers the most. You could also play this where you just remove one or two objects and you see if they can remember the missing object. It's definitely a memory game. Is that also called the tray game? Where you have a tray and you put maybe 10 objects on there. Yeah. And then you, what did you say? You take one away or you take some away and you see who can remember the objects. Exactly. How does that improve your vocabulary, Em? Again, it's repetition. It's just keeping those words going around the room and also you can add things which I quite like doing (laughs) or don't remove anything and then they're thinking for ages what's missing that's so much fun and you can add some objects that might be new for the students like scissors maybe they don't know the word scissors or hole punch and if you only add one or two new words or new objects to that group then students aren't under too much pressure to remember everything nice yeah One more M before we finish this part of the show. I quite like chalkboard acronym, which may be called whiteboard acronym now, I guess. You just write a word vertically down the board. You could ask a student to think of a word. And then going horizontally, the class have to come up with a word for each letter. Top to bottom? Any order you want, but yeah, top to bottom. And then you could actually expand that to make a poem if you wanted or a short story, starting with the first letter of that word. It could be a theme word, so you could have the word zebra going down and then everyone has to think of animals or something going across. Should we play that now, Em? Not with zebra, because I've just realised Z for zebra, I can't (laughs) think of another animal with Z. That also sounds like a really fun activity. So chalkboard or whiteboard, as you've just renamed it, acronym. Nice. Okay, Em, so there are loads of really fun and often materials-free activities that you can literally step into your classroom and saying to the students, right, we've got a great list of words. Let's find a way to practice, learn, memorize, and we can use these words into the future. It's so rewarding, Em. 
Last minute cover lessons don't have to be scary. They can be absolute joys to to do when you've got something like that just to have fun with. So as well as justlisten.com, you can also visit English Club where they have some online games. And if you've only got a little while to plan your lessons, these websites are great for picking up some tips to teach your students in the classroom or online. Thanks for exploring those with me, Em. That was a really enjoyable show and I'm incredibly excited to finish with our special guest teacher for... Teacher, teach, teach me. me! Who is Pooja at making underscore English underscore easy on Instagram where she makes videos and posts on vocabulary, pronunciation, tenses, prepositions and functional language like what to say when meeting people. Now let's get her explanation on these three confusing verbs see, look and watch. Note the difference between the usage of see, look and watch. We use see in a sentence when our eyes are just observing or casually looking at something. For example, I can see the cloud in the sky. Coming to the usage of look, we use look in a sentence when we make an effort to see something or direct our eyes to look in the particular direction or look at something. For example, look at the children playing in the park. And coming to the usage of watch, we use watch in the sentence when we look at something for a longer period of time carefully. For example, I am watching a movie. I hope it is clear. Do let me know are you seeing, looking or watching this reel. Thank you so much. Wow. In just one minute, Pooja was able to explain the differences between those really tricky words. They are very confusing words. My students often make these mistakes and it's so hard to keep in your mind the different uses of see, look and watch. So, as Pooja explained, see is more casual, look requires effort and to watch is a much longer process. So, M, can you explain what these uses of see, look and watch tell us? For example... I saw her yesterday. It means I was walking around outside somewhere, maybe, and I just happened to spot somebody I knew. Ah, and it could also mean that you actually met, because see here could actually mean to meet somebody, not only to visually observe them at a distance to see someone, but actually I saw them, meaning I met them. Gosh, that's really confusing, isn't it? That's true. If you just said, I saw her yesterday, you wouldn't know if it was glancing, kind of passing by on the bus, or whether it was sitting down to have coffee and a long chat. Mm -hmm. How about this sentence? Look at what she's doing now. That would be something like, quick, I want your attention because something's happening and I need you to look at it. It's quite emotional, that one, isn't it? Like, look... And also you could say, look what you've done. Yeah, so it requires some thought. It could be expressing annoyance. Look what you've done now. Yeah, or look at my photos from my holiday. It's just like, hey, I want you to pay attention to this. I want your full attention. Yeah. That's it. So if we apply some emotion to our voices, we can have even stronger meaning behind some of these verbs. What about the last one? I can't watch it. It's a bit harder because it's in the negative, but I suppose it just means I can't look at it for a long time. So this could be you're watching a nature documentary and you see the lion Mm. and it's about to attack the zebra and you say, oh, I can't watch it. I can't even look because I said look and that would be for a very short time Ah. maybe. So I can only look through my fingers, but I can't watch it for a long time. Okay. So we can see there's such slight but significant differences between these three verbs. So that's a really great way that we can break down some of this language by putting it in context and really explore the meaning behind each of the words. Thank you, Gav. And thank you to our special guests. We had Pooja, who you can find on Instagram under making underscore English underscore easy, 
And to our special guest, Kitty, don't forget to take a look at her Instagram, Kitty Kikuchi1509, or search Kitty Sensei on YouTube. And remember to find Wizbusters in our show notes for their special lifetime offer on membership of their vocabulary builder. It's such an amazing offer. Um, catch you on the flip side. Bye. 